That is, if we were to take the attitude which the United States had under the Kennedy Space Program, or it was actually the Eisenhower Kennedy Space Program from about 1958, the so-called Sputnik, post-Sputnik program, to about 1965, if we maintain that, combined with policies of tax investment credit, investment tax credits for investments of a suitable kind with a uh, science enrichment program in our schools and similar kinds of things that we did then, nothing more than that. I can assure you that knowing what we know is important to work upon in science, in technology, knowing the kinds of projects which are the best way to express these technological improvements, I assure you that if mankind on this planet had the political will to do that, we would increase the potential population density of this planet at a higher standard of living by a factor as much as 40 over the days. Next three generations, a factor of 10. We could sustain, by the end of this century, or by the end of the uh, two generations, we could say we would be sustaining a potential population in the order of magnitude of 100 billion people. More comfortably, much better fed, much more secure, much freer, much less crowded than today, because we'd use land more intelligently. There are two kinds of natural law or two aspects of natural law. One are the laws of the universe. And the man who, or say a Congress were to re repeal the law of gravity, just for illustration, would that repeal the law of gravity? It would not. So that whenever men, because they have great political power, say that they are defying what is in effect a law of the physical universe, a law of nature, natural law, and they cause others by their power to support that defiance of nature, what happens to the nations which defy nature? They are crushed, they're destroyed. Their defiance of natural law becomes the instrument of their destruction. If you support politicians, who engage in that defiance of natural law? What do you bring upon yourself and your nation? You become an accomplice. You enforce that destruction. You bring about the destruction of your nation, your family, of everything. That in order to deal with the kind of crisis which confronts us, we must look within ourselves and find a value within us so precious that if we spent our life to defend that value, we would have thereby gained our lives because we had gained the purpose of our mortal existence. Now that's what a, tr that's what a soldier ought to carry into battle is courage, not patriotism, but that. Not patriotism as a, the abstraction of a flag, not patriotism as a racist concept. Not patriotism as in any other of these symbolic senses. But patriotism in the sense which we ought to have in the United States, but we're pretty much estranged from. To know what Ben Franklin and the others represented. It's a system of representative self-government under natural law and under law governed by natural law that to imagine the horror of having once known such a form of self-government, to imagine living under slavery, which is not only a material oppression, but a destruction of the very soul of one's children. And there lies upon us then, and how we respond to that challenge. The moral responsibility for the fate of hundreds of billions of souls who, in all propriety, should be born in the time to come.
there lies upon us the responsibility of looking back to those martyrs who gave us institutions in which truth was given social standing and thus freedom. There is no freedom without truth and there is no truth without freedom. The right of an individual informed by right principles to come to an opinion based on reason, not arbitrary opinion, but based on careful employment of reason. And the right of that individual to stand up and say, this is what I believe unless I am persuaded to the contrary by reason. That is freedom. If the entirety of society disagrees with you, so what? You have the right, as long as you're guided by reason, and as long as you are sub will submit yourself to correction of your opinion by reason, that is the right to assert an opinion contrary to the majority of society around you, that is freedom. A democratic society, as Project Democracy in the Congress divides it today, is, is the most horrible abomination imaginable, against which the founders of the United States warned. Democracy is the worst of all evils, the worst of all tyrants, because there is no worse tyrant than in the irrational mob the lynch mob. Democracy, as they define it, is lynch mob democracy. Just don't have the wrong color of skin or the wrong color of opinion. Under which the individual has no right, but the right to agree with what appears to be majority or ruling opinion. And if the mob changes its opinion, you tear off your clothes and put on the clothes it puts on and so forth and so on. A society of fads and insanity with no moral purpose, no character, and no ability to reason. The defense of the individual who wishes to reason, who wishes to be governed by natural law and reason, that is the most sacred duty of society, the defense and nurture of such individuals. And a society which does not fulfill that mission is unfit to exist. A form of government which does not serve that purpose is not fit to exist because it does not protect the most precious part of human society, the development of the powers of reason in the individual. The thing that makes us truly human, the thing that makes our lives, individual lives, each sacred. And that's what is at stake. 